I think one of the things that I did that got people excited about open telemetry was showing them a path to using logging. I think the leap of faith, I think that probably was the hard part for most people because they hadn't seen it running at scale. They may not have been familiar with the project. They might not have seen the previous projects or even have a lot of familiarity with you know, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and they already had something working. And so I had to ask them to go and break it and make it better. Hello, I'm Martin Thwaite. And I'm Jessica Kerr. And you're listening to Observability Cast, or OllieCast for short, a monthly series where we talk about how we can make production systems more observable, more reliable, and easy to maintain. OllieCast is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor in developer-first startups. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on this show, or if you have a specific topic you'd like us to dive into, you can reach us on Twitter at OllieCast. That's at O-11-Y-C-A-S-T. So, Doug, you're sitting in front of a whale, and it reminds me of the company you work for. So you work at UpFlight, right? Yeah. Tell me how UpFlight fits with your ambitions as a human being. So... I've been at Uplight for about a year and a half. I am really fortunate and I have a ton of gratitude for the experiences I have had coming up on about 35 years, starting out as a computer programmer and having held lots of different positions as individual contributor, leader, manager, owner of a business, etc. And during that time, I've worked with pretty much every industry out there, entertainment, financial, manufacturing, healthcare. And one of the spaces I've never really spent any time is in the energy space. And I learned about Uplight and quickly became very interested in its mission. And it's to help save the planet. And we do that by helping utilities manage their grids efficiently and ultimately making sure that you know the resources that we're using to cool and heat our homes and buildings is done as efficiently as possible and as minimally as possible. And so I think that for a lot of people, that immediately can resonate with you as a human being living on Earth right now at this time. And being able to take my skills and experiences and apply that to that mission is like a perfect combination of things for me right now. The other thing that I really, really like about Uplight's mission and my ability to help them is also Uplight being a B corporation, a B certified corporation. And I think that that was very attractive to me as, as I learned more about what a B Corp is. What is a B Corp? It's not the kind of B that Honeycomb talks about. <laughs> <laughs> I think what it is, is it, it, the way I would describe it in, in a nutshell is to say it's a certification that businesses pass that proves that they're using business as a force for good. Oh, cool. And there's a number of criteria associated with that. And we, Uplight, are a B Corp, and I'm really proud of that. And I'm proud of our mission. And, you know, it's this is great for me to, you know, take the decades of experience and apply it in a completely new way. Perfect. And in your 35 years, a very diverse experience, now you're excited about observability? Yeah, I mentioned this story when people ask me about observability, and I, I think it resonates for pretty much anybody who's doing what we do, writing code, building systems. And for me, observability reminds me of the excitement that I got the first time I started writing software. For me, it was adding some numbers on a teletype that was connected to a 300 baud modem that was wow. connected to a very large computer on the grounds of the University of Virginia, where my, my father was a statistician and a math professor. And I think it's hard for people like us to explain why we get so excited about that, that immediate sense of feedback and gratification you get by like getting the machine to do something for you that you want it to do. And for me, observability you know, especially these days in the type of environments, the type of tech stacks that we have to build things. It's hard to see what we do because our software gets shipped to places that we can't see, that we don't know where they are. And having observability 
to me, brings back that excitement and that gratification you get of saying, oh, I asked the machine to do something. I gave it a set of instructions. I wanted to solve this problem. I wanted to do something with this piece of hardware. Now I get to see it actually happening. And so going back a long time ago, before 35 years, and I was a little kid doing that program on the teletype, you know, today I get that same level of excitement when I ship services and APIs to somewhere in the cloud, but then I get to watch it run. So that's why observability is very interesting to me. That's so cool. Yeah, that feeling that you get writing that first Hello World application yeah, and you hit run and then it prints out Hello World and then you, you make it dynamic and then you, yeah. you, you add your name and you put in your name in the command line and then it comes back and it's, it's that rush of excitement that I don't think we really get from just writing a bit of code yeah, and we write a bit more code until we actually see it. Yeah. And, you know, for those of us that write, you know, I, I'm primarily lately, uh, primarily been exclusively building, you know, backend systems, systems integration, APIs, you know, services that enable things that people ultimately see. It's very, very rare that I work on or, on or touch a piece of code that a human interacts with. It's mostly machines. And so when you deploy something like a new API or a new service and you kind of watch other pieces of software starting to interact with your software. You don't even know who these people are. You don't know what software they're even using. You just see their requests coming in. To me, that's also really exciting too. It's like, oh, I built something and I can see it running and I can see people using it. This is awesome. So for me, it really does go back and kind of scratch that itch and kind of elevate that excitement that you know I had, a lot of people have when you just first start writing software. So I'm a big fan, obviously, and I'm very passionate and very excited about it. Yeah, it's like uh, some people really enjoy Raspberry Pi and robotics and Internet of Things and anything that like makes something physical that you can see. Other people really like UI development because it's something you can see and interact with as a person. Yeah. And then those of us who work on abstractions within abstractions that are summoned by other abstractions, uh, it's not so physical until you get to look at that trace waterfall yeah, and count all the trace waterfalls and then you can celebrate them. Yeah. I think graphs is our front end, isn't it? That the, the building of the graphs and the building of the heat maps and the, I mean, we have a channel dedicated to just the art that comes out of building graphs based on your telemetry. Oh, interesting. <laughs> it's such an interesting thing to see. Like, oh, my system created this thing. Maybe that's our UI. That's what we see. That's our, um, that visceral thing of seeing something. It's a window from the social to the technical half of our social technical system. Yeah. And it knits us together. I'm probably jumping ahead a, a bit here, but one of the things that also interests me about observability and, and, and following along with that knitting analogy is that with standards and open specifications, I can actually see how my software, my hello world, my thingy actually is part of that fabric of the ecosystem of things that we build, right? Like now I can start to see calls coming into my service, but I can actually see calls that are making it to another service. And that we can view the interactions between all these, these myriad of services by having distributed tracing and not by having these, you know, these visualizations of how everything's working together. So that's the other thing that I get really excited about as well. It's like I can say to somebody else who might be building a, a front end or a back end for front ends or whatever it may be, I'm, you know, if we all agree to emit our observability signals this way, then we can all let it land in some place and we can see how everything has started to work together. Perfect. You can see your code's place in the wider software system. Yeah. Excellent. And of course, that's going to lead us directly into open telemetry. Before we do that, tell our listeners who you are. I'm Doug Ramirez. I work at Uplight. I'm a principal engineer and architect of our data platform. I've been with Uplight for about a year and a half. Prior to Uplight, I have spent several decades in the software world. Um, started out writing code at um, General Electric. was my first job out of school in 1990. I had a dumb terminal in my office and I wrote COBOL on paper. 
Wow. <laughs> and then I typed it, and then I typed it into an 80 by 24 character terminal using a line editor. I don't know if anybody remembers line editors, but essentially you edit a character or a set of characters at a time on a line on a terminal. Things have gotten a lot better since then. <laughs> I've held lots of different positions in the software world as an individual contributor, analyst, manager, director, head of things, owner of a consulting business. And I'm now an individual contributor and an architect. And I'm really lucky to be able to take 35 years of failing a lot and succeeding sometimes and trying to <laughs> help Uplight succeed its mission. Failure is the true educator. <laughs> yeah. Great. So you just brought up open standards for observability for fitting any, everything in. You brought open telemetry into Uplight? Correct. I think I should qualify that by saying harder than it probably should have been, harder than I wanted it to be, but hard in the sense that like a lot of big shifts that are introduced to a large software organization, there's always going to be some some time and conversations and challenges along the way, but we have adopted it. It is our go forward observability way, and it's proving to be very, very successful. We have a long ways to go. There's lots of things I want to do with it, but I'm happy to say that you know, to a certain degree, we're, we're a no-tell shop. Like our software runs and it lets the rest of the world know what it's doing by honoring the the observability signals and the specification that open telemetry provides. And we can land all those signals into platforms like Honeycomb, and we can do interesting things to observe how all the software is working in ways that we couldn't do before. So it's, it's proven to be really, really beneficial. Was that a social kind of hard or a technical kind of hard? Social. I think that, uh, you know, fortunately for us and a lot of, a lot of other organizations, the Open Telemetry Project was able to leverage some existing projects that had been around before, like Open Census and Open Tracing. So I think the, the technology is mature, it's well thought out, and the support that the, the community gives via things like the collector, the SDKs, et cetera, I think that that solved most of the technical challenges we had. I think for us, it was more around this idea of trusting the specifications, trust in the community, and being okay with using some pieces of open telemetry that were not as stable as others. The log specification, I think, is one thing that required a lot of conversations. I think up until recently, if it hasn't been marked as stable, I can't remember. I think the, I think the log spec the log data model is now accepted. I don't know about the SDKs, but there was definitely some concerns around the maturity of open telemetry, even though it, it benefited from the maturity of open census and open tracing. So I think the newness from some people's perspective was a concern. I think that for some people, just the idea of leaning into an open source project and not integrating directly with an APM vendor felt a little strange. I think some people might not have had that experience before. And I think that there was also just this idea of, I don't know how to call it, but it's like almost like the fear of the, of the least common denominator. Like I think people felt like they might be constrained by being quote unquote forced into a specification. As we talked about it and as I talked about it and as I evangelized this with the folks internally, I think we all started to realize that in the absence of open telemetry, if we had come up with our own specification, it would probably look lo a lot like the specification that open telemetry came up with. <laughs> and it is extensible. Yes. That's interesting. Uh, open telemetry benefits from not being the first specification in this space. Correct. Of at least for tracing, there was Jaeger and Zipkin and Open Tracing and Open Census before it. And somehow the people involved in those communities actually came together to deprecate theirs and go with this common one. Yeah. And that is the, the true triumph of open telemetry is two open source of projects agreeing to come together and be one. Yeah. You know, the whole, let's just create a new standard because we need to unify the previous two standards. And what do we have? Now we have three standards. Yep. 
But, you know, we actually have one. You know, Open Census was recently deprecated. They yeah. Yeah. they started to close things off. Jaeger has um, like sunsetted their protocol, the, the Thrift protocol. That is oh, one of the, the true triumphs um, of Open Telemetry was these projects going, yep, we're out. That one's better. Right. Um, and we're going to take the best bits from both of them and bring them together. Yeah. So the social challenge was, you know, taking the sleep of faith, like, asking people who had already done a direct integration with an APM vendor, asking them to refactor their code, to trust that the community and the specification was well thought out, to trust that the the collector, the SDKs and all the tooling was there. And I think to a certain degree to trust me to say like, I'm confident that this is going to provide benefit even though we haven't done it at scale at Uplight yet. My experience, my intuition, I became very, very confident in what I saw as the vision for observability and uplight with open telemetry. And so part of what I had to do was simply to ask people to take a leap of faith, to assume some risk and trust that this was all going to work out. And for some people, that's hard to do. I've been on the other side. I've heard people like me get excited and evangelize things and get super passionate about it. And it hasn't always worked out. So Having some healthy skepticism is good. It definitely forced me to to really think and double check my math and asking people to join me on this journey. I think the leap of faith, I think that was part of the, I think that was the hard part, probably was the hard part for most people because they hadn't seen it running at scale. They may not have been familiar with the project. They might not have seen the previous projects or even have a lot of familiarity with, you know, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and they already had something working. And so I had to ask them to go and break it and make it better. But make it better in a way that's compatible with everything else. Correct. At Uplight. Uh, I read somewhere that Uplight is built out of many smaller companies. Correct. Yes. Uplight is a couple years old. The the legacy companies, as we call them, are, are much older than that. But the, the Uplight brand... It's a collection of companies that are all trying to solve the same macro problem in a way that's very complementary. So this wasn't about like collapsing companies together and then putting, you know, all the customers onto a platform and then deprecating the previous products or brands. This is more like, hey, these are all pieces that are all working together to solve a problem, whether it is a white label marketplace to get smart devices or a machine learning model that understands the physics behind a building and how to pre-cool it and pre-warm it so that we can help a a, a utility manage their grid efficiently. So all of these different things were complementing each other. So our challenge has been to bring everything together and get our platforms to work together and integrate with each other. So your software is built out of a bunch of software that was written by different companies, probably in different languages. Yep. At different times. Correct. That sounds really challenging. It is. <laughs> it is. Yeah, so you can't you can't declare, well, we're a Java shop. Not when you intend to keep using a bunch of software that was created in many different languages. But you used the phrase earlier, we're an Otel shop. Yeah, and that's kind of, I think that's one of the things that I find really powerful about um, open telemetry and... This was part of the leap of faith that I asked people to join me in. And that is to say, yes, that's old software. Yes, it's written in a myriad of languages using a myriad of data persistence layers and using all kinds of crazy software design patterns. But if we all simply agree to speak this one language, then guess what? We can observe this myriad of you know heterogeneous applications and a mixed mash of technologies and stacks and frameworks. We could actually watch it all working together. So open telemetry in all its myriad SDKs and automatic instrumentation is speaking all the different programming languages to the different applications, allowing all of those applications to speak the same language to you. Correct. As a developer and maintainer and operator. Yeah. So that from your perspective, you can still work with software in a bunch of different languages. Yeah. And one of the things that I, I think I benefited from with the timing of the open telemetry project is that 
you know, I've, I've, I'm also kind of curious to know like where, where you've seen people talk about this before, but I think one of the things that I did that got people excited about open telemetry was showing them a path to using logging. I think that, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, like hello world, it prints out like print statements, log statements, like those are kind of like our, our, our hello world. Like we can immediately see what's happening. I can print to the console, I can log a message somewhere, I can actually see my code running. And I think that for most software developers, print statements, log statements are how they usually watch their code working. Yeah, they're like the most direct, fast thing to be like, just just tell me. Right, exactly. I'm here. This number has this value. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this took this long. Might, might say Jess in big letter. Right. Oh, the 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 here, here also here yep. here three yep. um, <laughs> here four <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I kind of benefited from the fact that the log SDK was available in most of the languages. Was that more approachable to people than tracing? I think so. Yes, I think in, in my experience, I think really good implementations of metrics and tracing usually I've seen that in more mature teams or more mature software organizations. But logs are everywhere. And it makes me sad. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so my thinking was, if I can tell the story and create a vision of the future and then work with people to simply start by getting logs into their applications. Like my first thing was just get the SDK into your repo, start emitting some logs and watch them land at the upstream APM. I think for some people that was the first hurdle to get over. And my thought was if I could get developers excited about logging, which most of them are, it resonates, they're familiar with it. If I could get them to lean into open telemetry, create quote unquote observability using logging, then I could level them up with very, very minimal effort. Now I can go back and say, hey, I want to talk to you about trace log correlation and I want to talk about tracing. I want to talk about distributed tracing and why these things, why these tools and these concepts are really, really powerful. And guess what? You only need to write a few more lines of code and you can be there because you have the SDK in your repo. You're already using it. You're emitting that signal. It's hitting a collector. It's being received, processed, and exported someplace else. All you have to do is a few lines of code, and now look at that. You can see a trace in the span, and guess what? You can see your logs that were emitted associated with that. How cool is that? I, I do like to talk about logs and spans, and I actually have a, a sticker that I created that traces are just basically fancy logs. Nice. Um, because if you start with logs, and you start with this idea of, um, like you say, you build them up, and they're like, they've got a log line. It's like, well, wouldn't it be great if that log line was now a stream of properties? Um, so it wasn't just a human readable thing. Now we've got a stream of properties that give us different bits of context about what was happening. Great. Okay. And then they go, well, what if we added a duration on there? Um, and we started to put in maybe how long it took when you did that message, you wrapped a context and now you said how long it took. So, oh, great. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that. What if we also said what was happening before this happened? And you go, uh, yeah, that'd be really interesting. It's like, right, now you've got a trace. Um, so you're kind of walking people to that idea of, well, what you've got's great, but how can you make it better? How can you get that little baby steps of, well, just add this and just add this. And then eventually they're there with, oh, we've got a full trace now. And that makes this diagram so much better. That makes our debugging experience so much better. But it's hard from a, uh, um, a human perspective to jump from, I just want to log things in the console to I'd like a big distributed trace up on a screen somewhere that I can see when things go wrong. Yeah. That does feel from a human perspective, a big leap. Right. So I like that idea of like, how do you take people from that and just start adding bits on and had adding bits on? You've already got the, like you say, you've already got the SDKs there. Yeah. I think that's one of the, the powers of open telemetry because it's one SDK. It's the open telemetry SDK, which you can get logs, traces, metrics, and obviously um, down the road, maybe more out of it. Um, so you've already got the tools there. Yeah. Right. So they take the hello world that they have in front of them and step one, get that up on the console and then turn it into traces and have those on the console. I really like that. 
suddenly I'm, I'm much more enamored with open telemetry logs. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think um, it, it's interesting the way that we, our journey unfolded. And, you know, because logs were kind of the last thing to really get baked into the open telemetry specification. But it's where we started. And I think that, you know, our approach admittedly kind of violated that idea of like, do the hard thing first. Right. So for me, the hardest thing would be distributed tracing because now it's, it's, it's like contract based programming. Like in the world of logging, I don't necessarily need to talk to anybody else. I don't need to agree on anything else. As a developer, I can just print log, print log all day long. But when you used open telemetry for those logs, you like snuck in all that connectivity. <laughs> the Trojan horse. Yes. Open telemetry as a Trojan horse. I like it. Exactly. <laughs> that was my plan. I don't think I was being evil. Like, I think I was being well-intended about this idea. I think we call that strategic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I felt like introducing, like starting out with distributed tracing, which to me is kind of like the holy grail of observability, because especially that in this world that we live in today. But I thought if I had to ask people to like take this leap of faith, go on this journey with me, yeah. believe in the vision that I'm painting, and start to introduce concept like, well, the W3C trace context specification, and these is what are, like getting into those details, I feel like I was going to start to lose people because it would have meant that if I'm a developer on a team with a service, in order for this to work very well, I need to get other people to agree to something. And if I could get them started by get, get, getting the logging going, getting the SDKs into the repos, then I could go back to those people and say, okay, now let me, let me show you this W3C specification around trace contacts. And let me talk to you about why this specification is important. And guess what? You're a piece of software that can speak this already natively. It can do it. Nice. And then you just flip that bit. The trace context comes in. Magic. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it, it, it all starts to work. And, and I think that it's proven to be successful. Like this idea of starting with logging and then leveling up to metrics, traces, and then distributed tracing. It, I'm watching that unfold. I wish it were going faster, but it is happening. The whale is lifting off. I mean, I, I love, I, I mean, this all goes back to the good software engineering pr principles of small baby steps, you know, not, not the big bang, you know, that, well, let's get, like you say, let's just get some logs. Let's get the SDK. Let's get this. Let's get this. And you're building up over time, which is just good software engineering in general, um, to try and do things incrementally, which I, I, I just love that idea, um, that you're doing things small incremental steps. Yeah. You also mentioned do the hard thing first. Uh, which is different from small incremental steps, but I think do the when when I hear do the hard thing first, I think make sure it's possible, make sure that it's possible to correlate all these different emissions from all these different systems. And Open Telemetry's done that work for you. Yeah. So at Uplate, you have all these disparate softwares running and talking to each other now, and you're not trying, from what I hear, you're not trying to move them to a single platform. Is that true? Yes and no. There are certainly parts of our ecosystem of software where there is some duplication and some old tech that we would like to collapse onto like a new go-forward tech stack for that service or that set of features. But because the applications are complementary, we don't necessarily need to go through a very risky, large effort to put everything into one place. Right. There, there are definitely places within the business where we are kind of really leaning into this idea of platforms and trying to collapse features that are similar into larger platforms. But for the most part, the, the different stacks, the different applications and the teams can continue to develop code the way they were before. Okay, so there's an evolution that is planned as in moving forward as we gradually consolidate and further integrate. There's a platform for that. Yep. But in the meantime, you've asked all these different software bits to effectively conform to an API, except it's an operator interface. Correct. In the form of open telemetry. Yeah. 
I think that's a great vision and and a very like it feels like a responsible vision. Like you're not knocking down all the trees to build a highway. Yeah, and and I think that as as the companies came together and as we started to see, you know, pieces of software from one company talking to pieces of software of another company, like being able to observe that is just incredibly important. Because there's parts of our observability journey where I get really excited because I'm a huge advocate for the developer experience. I'm constantly trying to run interference for our developers and make sure that they're protected and so that they can have all the cognitive load back to work on their work and hopefully to enjoy the craft while they're doing it. And so part of my passion around observability is to elevate the developer experience, protect the developer and let them do their job. But also for, for Uplight, and I think a lot of companies, but especially for us being a company of companies with complementary applications and products, it's really, really important for us to be able to observe how our software is interacting with each other. Right, because if you can observe all the consequences of your action to the wider system, then you can act responsibly in the wider system. Yeah, and I think that in, in the spirit of our mission, I think it's also just paramount that, that Uplight executes observability really well. Like we need to be good humans, residents of the planet, and make sure that our code is operating as efficiently as possible. I think like a lot of companies, we have a long ways to go in improving the efficiency of our, our code and our software systems. But I think that Uplight's ability to achieve that mission and stay true to you know, its core, it would be almost impossible to do without really solid observability. I couldn't think of how you could achieve the goal of having, you know, massive amounts of software all operating as efficiently as possible, having the smallest footprint on the planet without really being able to see what your software is doing when it's running in production at scale all day, every day. I have a feeling that that thing you noticed, that it's almost impossible to achieve our goals without observability, is something often felt by people once they have it, and yet people who've never had it before are like, what are you talking about? I'm already doing this job. Yeah. <laughs> Which is true, but it, it just feels so much easier when you can see what you're doing. I mean, it's similar to tests, isn't it? The, the people who didn't have unit tests, the way that they made sure their application ran was to run it locally, start doing some stuff. And then when they start working with tests and they go, well, this is just so much easier. I can do things so much quicker. I can I can verify that what I what I thought was going to happen happens quicker. My tightrope is so much wider. Yeah, and it's it's like how, how did I work before I had this? Yeah, and then they go right, okay, and now I've done that, and then they go wider testing and all. The, it's same with any of these concepts. Yeah. Like how do I work without an, a an IDE? Yeah, you know how do I work without X IDE? How do you work with a line editor? <laughs> <laughs> Slowly and very carefully after you've written it out on a piece of paper. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I think that I get to benefit from as being an older software engineer, computer programmer, is that in the last several years, I've really started to finally understand what it means when we say things like, we want our architecture to be intentional because we want it to be a sponsor of innovation. Oh, you're, you want your architecture to be a sponsor of innovation. Of innovation. Okay. And so one of the things that, so uh, you mentioned the testing and it got me thinking along this thread because this was also part of my my pitch and my, my ask of Uplight engineers to follow me on this journey was this idea of having your architecture be a sponsor of innovation. And one of the ways I think about it in the world of observability is this idea of when you get your application emitting the signals, logs, metrics, traces, distributed traces, spans, all the things in there, and you can see them all being tied together. You can see the interaction between your software and another piece of software. To me, that's a perfect example of how your architecture can sponsor innovation. If I can ship code and I can immediately see how it's behaving in a runtime environment, to me, that does something 
cosmically for the developer. It like creates a sense of trust. Ooh, trust. And it creates a sense of knowing that I can ship software safely, reliably, predictably. I can see how it's going to operate immediately. I'm going to be told when it does something that I wasn't expecting. And I can just lean into that trust. And I think for me, and I think for other developers, it kind of removes some of the noise and just allows your brain to to be more open and think more creatively about how you want to solve the next problem that you're working on. And so to me, part of observability and baking it into the way that we do things at Uplight is really about sponsoring innovation. Wow. It's deep. I was kind of, I was going to ask more, another question, but you know what? That's just such a beautiful place to end. Okay. Thank you so much for, for, for being on. Yeah, no problem. I think it's probably pretty obvious that I, I actually am very passionate about this stuff and I really do enjoy writing software even to this day. <laughs> I, I love doing it. Um, so if our listeners want to find more of your wisdom, where can they look for you? I'm, I'm kind of cringing. I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to say LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn does not suck. No judgment, no, no comment, no editorial, <laughs> no color around that. Just I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn slash Doug Ramirez. You can find that link in the show notes. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you all. It was very nice meeting you. That's all we have time for today. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you would like to suggest a topic, Find us on Twitter at OllieCast. That's O-1-1-Y-C-A-S-T. OllieCast is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor in developer-first startups. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com.